But okay, so uh, we create new object. Let it go to heap. Heap will just dedicate the region of memory that JVM has allocated for you. And then comes garbage collector, whose sole responsibility is to clean all those unused objects and throw them away. So the garbage collector is a subsystem of JVM. Uh, the, the idea of garbage collector was that uh, object management and Okay, so uh, yeah, the whole point was that garbage collector can and should do his work in totally transparent way, which means that you as application developer shouldn't think about it at all. You create objects, you use new and you, f and you forget about that. You sleep well knowing that your garbage, uh, your objects will be taken care of. Unfortunately, uh, that's not completely true. Because the more objects you have, the more work garbage collector has to do. And here's one catch, is that uh, the time that garbage collector needs to clean your objects and to handle your uh, application, that time depends not upon the size of your heap, it depends upon the amount of leaf objects that, do, uh, that, that you have in your application. So the more objects you have in your heap, in your running JVM, the more time garbage collector will need to clean them up. And starting with some allocation rate, that time is actually quite big. And I will show some examples of, of that. So, the problem when you create too many objects is that your application spent more and more time in garbage collector, so CPU is, is, is executing garbage collector code and not your application code. So your application from the outside point of view, from your end client, you, uh, end user's point of view, your, your application is slow because it uses only a fraction of CPU. So uh, one of the solutions that I will talk to today, because well, one solution is of course create less objects. That's that totally totally good and fine so, so, solution. Another so, solution is just uh, throw your garbage, create your object somewhere where garbage collector doesn't see it. Garbage collector monitors only the heap that specific region of, of, of memory. If you create objects outside of the heap in the native memory, so you just grab memory from the operation system and Java does allow you, you to do that, if you create your objects outside of the heap, garbage collector will not monitor the, them, will not handle them, will not create them, and so will not waste time working with those objects. And so CPU cycles are free to execute your application, your business logic. So, uh, you, and then you can create as many objects, as many data as you want. The only problem is that you have to manage that memory yourself. As soon as you go outside of the heap, outside of the normal objects, then you have essentially free memory free in the sense of garbage, co garbage collector time, but you have to clean that memory your, yourself. Sometimes it's much more efficient because you, you, you know exactly what the lifespan of your, of your objects, you know when do you need them, when you can throw, throw them away, and you can do that in batches that can be more efficient, and I will show the examples. Uh, 
the problem is that when you create object, for example, we have some class trait which have three, four fields. When you create that in Java, you, you do new trait and that's all. When you want to create that object yourself of the heap, there are no objects of the heap. Of the heap essentially means some continuous region of memory. That's byte array, essentially. So you do need to take your object and to tear it apart into tiny pieces, into bytes, and allocate those bytes by hand in that continuous byte array. So you are back to the dark times of C. You just allocate byte array, you, you tear your objects in tiny pieces, you lay out them into, in, into memory in the way that you want, and you have to remember to clean that, then up, that up. Uh, by the way, this uh, have, uh, has one more uh, benefit is that when you use objects in, in JVM, every object in JVM, apart from its fields, has a header. Every object in running JVM has a special, well, part called header, which is needed by JVM for its housekeeping. And that, uh, and that header is quite large. In its, well, on average, depending on, on your JVM bitness, depending on your heap size, it's around 12 bytes for one object. So if you have this object, which has uh, 13 bytes of data, but when you create new new trait, then you in fact you, uh, you allocate from the heap 25 bytes. And if you take alignment into account, that will be 32 bytes. So when you create new object, new trait on the heap, it will take 32 bytes when you create that over the heap by hand, it will take only 13 bytes. So one more benefit of using off heap, apart from less GC work, is compaction. Okay, and that was all from the slides. Now I will show the demo. First of all, I will just go ahead and start the first demo because it's the most it's the longest one and then i will explain what what i'm doing here so i have one interface very simple interface of stock exchange which has only two two methods order and day balance so we can pass some orders to our stock exchange, ticket amount, price, and other we are buying or selling. And at the end of the day, we can ask, well, how many, how many money has went through that stock exchange during the day? And we know by some oracle or miracle that we have around 50 million transactions per day. We assume that, that we know that. So we have stock exchange interface and I have some performance tests which each, each of them is, is essentially just executes those 50 million transactions a day and ask for a day balance. And I have some different implementations of, the, of that stock exchange. The first implementation is very simple. When we create an, an order, we just create a new object, trade object that you, that you have seen before. And we store that object into some list. In this particular implementation, we use linked list. And before you call me crazy, please wait a little bit. So we have linked list, we put new trades in there. 50 mi millions of them. Okay, and I have test running, and we have here, if somebody sees something, we have the time, how, how, many, how much time does it take to pass 50 
millions of transactions uh, using that implementation. And so we see that it's time, well, it's fluctuating between 20 seconds to 36 seconds. And well, that's quite long. I promise the next demos are a little bit faster. So let us wait a little bit because that's the first point I would like to show you. If you have any questions so far, you can ask me. That's a good time because we have to wait a little bit. So we have very simple implementation. Oh, as Madman, and I will show you that. And uh, so right now the garbage collector uh, is doing very, very hard work. And I will prove that. More questions? Uh, yes, I know, that's, that's long. You, you have to suffer. That's on, on purpose. Uh, yeah, that may be a valid point unless you have to, well, at the end of the day you have, you, you have to have all trades that you had due, due, during that day, for some reason. But that may be a valid point, yes. Ah, good, good one. One iteration went only 9 seconds. Four times faster than other one, other ones. Why? Can anybody guess? Garbage collector. Because when you have garbage collector, one of the problems is that you have, well, overhead. And in this case, I will show you a huge overhead. Another problem is that you, have, you do not have predictability. You have no idea when garbage collector will flow into your code, stop JVM, and say, well, now I will do my work, all of you just wait. And all of you, it does mean, among other things, your clients. So imagine yourself, you're, you, you went to Amazon, you want to buy that book. You click buy, request goes to server, but by chance, garbage collector on that server will kick in for unknown amount of time, and you wait, you wait. Oh fuck, I'll go to eBay. Yeah. No. No. That doesn't work. Don't try to outsmart garbage collector in this way. Because uh, by specific first of all, by specification system GC is just the request to ask. That's not the, an order. The JVM can uh, ignore that. So, okay. We have our result. Uh, so on average, we have the time of 20 seconds. We have standard deviation of 6 seconds. So if you know statistics, we have confidence interval between 14 seconds and 27 seconds. So how much time will it take to run 50 million transactions in this, in this stock exchange? I don't know, somewhere between 18 and 27 seconds. And if we look for garbage collector, then we see if we look <coughs> here, let me show you. Ah. Let me show you this way. Here, total time of execution of our test was five minutes. From those five minutes, total GC time. Time when GC was working, not your application, is 390 by 319. So your application runs run only 1% of those 5 minutes. All other time was GC. So if you can throw GC away, you have 
100 times speed up. Imagine that, yeah. Would it change the feature if you were using some fancier PC, like there are concurrent parallel Maybe, maybe. I haven't tried here, but yes, maybe. Uh, more or less, more or less. So okay. Uh, now let's let us see uh, another implementation of the, of of the same, where I change only one thing. I replace linked list with array list. The most simple fix. One data structure replaced for another data, data structure. And let it run. In, in the meanwhile, I will explain the real speed up. So the next, uh, the next one is byte buffer. So, uh, this implementation, uh, first of all, we have a stock exchange that on the, uh, uh, when, it, when we create that, we allocate byte buffer, we, uh, we ask JVM, give me the byte array with the size of 50, uh, 50 millions times 13. We have objects with 13 bytes of data. So give me one array of this size. And then when we create when we pass a new order, we essentially what we do, we seek in, in that one big byte array to the right index, like here, object size uh, times index, and then we just lay out our raw data in that byte array. So we have new trade, we seek into a correct index, then we tell, okay, four byte, one integer, that's ticket, in, uh, in, uh, ticket ID, four bytes, uh, one integer, that will be the price for the simplicity, Four bytes that will be the the amount and one who was that one byte will be either we we buying or selling. So uh, that's a standard public API in Java. Byte buffer is standard API. That's not some obscure. So you you create one big array. When you create objects, you just stick into right index, you lay them out. If you want to read those objects, you, you again, you go to right uh, index and you read those objects byte by byte. And in the end, you have to clear that byte array. So byte array or byte buffer is standard Java API from Java Neo package, available from Java 6, I believe. Java 4, 1.4, so, well, from, from the ancient time. And now let us see. So, array list. Average execution time, 6 seconds, 6 and a half. Comparing to linked list, 3 times faster. Just by changing one implementation, just by changing one data structure. So one lesson from here, do not use linked lists. Never, ever. Some, some Oracle guy from St. Petersburg uh, tried very hard to make a use case where linked list is better than array list. They failed. There is no use case when you should use linked list. When you think about performance. If you have three element list, well, use whatever you like. If you think about performance, array list is the way to go. In this particular use case, three times faster. Okay, 
but let me uh, let me show you if we use that byte buffer implementation. Ah, and in case of array list, GC a little bit better. We have uh, only seven seven percent of time devoted to your application, not one per percent. So a little bit better. Okay. Byte buffer. Standard Java API can allocate byte buffers uh, of, of any size, of, well, almost any size. And you have, in fact, two different uh, options you can use either, well, general byte buffer or direct byte buffer. The only difference is that, if I'm not mistaken here, that byte, uh, common byte buffer is allocated on the heap, direct byte buffer is allocated off the heap, requesting operation system give me that byte array. And you can allocate byte buffer with integer capacity, so it's not humongous, it's only huge. Okay, two seconds. Three times faster than using array list and Java objects. And ten times faster than using our initial implementation, but while well, initial implementation was cheating, so array list. Uh, three times faster when we when you use uh, byte buffers. Okay, uh, and GC. Yeah, that's a perfect question. No GC, or almost no GC. We have fifteen seconds total execution time, only zero point six seconds of GC time. So the efficiency or the throughput of our execution was comparing to the previous 7%, we now have 96%. Well, that's a good speed up, don't, don't, don't you think? Yeah. It's a provocatory question. Huh? It's a provocatory question. Yeah, sure. Why the hell should I use Java then? What do you see? Uh, good question, in fact. Uh, very good question. And why you should use Java in this case? Because this, comparing to row C, gives you uh, a little bit type checking. So you you still operate with integers or longs or characters, for example, and it gives you range checking. You cannot corrupt me memory here. You cannot tell. Uh, you cannot go to the offset which is beyond allocated buffer. Java here gives you range checking. You, you have a guarantee that you can operate and overwrite memory only which was all allocated to that byte buffer. So you can corrupt a video driver for example. Uh, yes. Uh, the, it 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 doesn't change anything because well uh, allocation or resizing of array list comparing to those uh, garbage collector operations is almost free of charge. Array list uh, uh, resizing is is pre pretty fast. And in, in fact, I have tried here to pre-allocate the array list to their to, to that fifty million elements. It, it didn't change significantly, significantly the end result. So it, it doesn't change anything. So here uh, we still have more or less uh, object orientation. We have our object, which is well just a window to that big byte array, but nevertheless for the rest of the application, you still have an object, 
you just cannot create an arbitrary object uh, by yourself. You have to ask the exact one. It, it will give you the uh, window to that uh, byte array and you have your range checking and more or less uh, type checking. Okay, that was uh, byte buffers. <clears throat> and the uh, one more, if I have time, a little bit, let us try this one, mapped by a byte buffer. file stock and change. And what we, what we do here, comparing to the previous uh, byte buffer, is that we, we take a file, physical file on the hard disk, and we map that file into memory using operation system, well, more or less operation system, a specific way that again is a standard Java API that you can take a run a, a arbitrary file uh, and and map that file into memory, and then you again co co communicate with that mapped file as a huge byte array. And I am not quite sure if we have if we will have. Oh, okay, it works. And as you see, we have results. Yeah, where was which are well a little bit slower than byte buffer. Well, fifty per percent slower than byte buffer, but we have an extra benefit of persistent persistence because that data that you write into that mapped file is backed by a file you essentially write to hard disk. And still that implementation is two times faster than a released one. Because you squeeze that object into byte array. You, you do not have... Okay. Okay, sorry, we don't... We don't have any. We don't have G GC. Uh, so you, you, you don't have overhead of object headers, you don't have overhead of object allocators, you don't have the overhead of GC. And you have persistence. Sometimes that's a good option, so I'll just let you know. You can write to files two times faster than you write to memory. More or less. No? You write to map file two times faster than you write to array list. Okay, and the last implementation is of course unsafe. And what does unsafe means? Unsafe means that we now go to Save. Where is my constructor? Yeah. So you use sun misc unsafe class, sun misc unsafe. That's not standard API anymore. And you can judge by its name that that's unsafe to use. So do not use it. But if you want to, you can. And you just use unsafe allocate memory. And in this case, you get the byte array and all checks are off. You do not have any range checks, you do not have any type checks. You just have raw array of memory that you can overflow, you can go beyond that, you can corrupt anything you like. Other than that, it's just usual uh, array of bytes. But no range checks. Unsafe. And in this case, we have the performance of ah, that's better. 
So that's about four times faster than in case of byte buffer. Because one of the reasons because range checks are off. So you don't need to check for range on every ac memory access. Yeah, I had a question. Yeah, so that's when you can do between C++? Yeah. So uh, what are reasons to use unsafe comparing to C is, well, I don't know. Uh, one of the reasons is maybe is because, well, I write my application in Java, so I will continue to write my application in Java. Yeah, and you only perform specific parts. Yes, exactly. So if you go unsafe, you get the fastest performance, you have the lowest uh, variance, so you have the highest predictability in your results, but, well, you have the lowest safety. So you have no safety at all. That's unsafe. You can't do that, but on your risk. And uh, sometimes that's good because, well, really, if you have some performance critical small part of your application that you really need to run fast, uh, unsafe uh, with his tricks can go to your rescue and give you some very interesting uh, possibilities. But, well, I haven't told you that. And that essentially all, because, well, I, ha I have discovered that I have only 14, 14 mi minutes. So, to... Uh, that code is available on the GitHub. You can check it out and play with it. Essentially, we have standard implementation with Java data structures and do not use linked list because array list is almost is always be, uh, better. Uh, you can use standard Java API to access byte buffers and to lay out your data in any way you, you like and you get uh, almost an order of magnitude uh, performance boost. Well, at least five times. Half an order of magnitude. Almost true. Uh, if that's not enough, you can go unsafe, that's the fastest. And if you need to, you can try and you have you can persist your data on, on the file, still getting the performance boost of not using objects. And if you have questions, please ask. Other than that, thank you for your attention. Um, uh, the re uh, uh, you have limitation at least from Java API size because you, you can map uh, regions which is only okay long size so that you have limitation but the, it's somewhere over there because long the amount of bytes you can squeeze into long is well quite big. I can I cannot top I can tell from top of my head. So, uh, but I believe you have uh, the stricter limitation will be from your file system, because the file can be only as big as your file system allows you to. Not not bigger. But you wh what you can do if if you like you can to uh, partition that data into different files. That, that and you just, just well some index you can map indexes into this file on this file or this file. We uh, we did that in some in some cases when we wanted to map files which are bigger than uh, than than API laws. Comparing to Compared what? To, uh, raw object, as, as that you have. Because in this case, you have to read, you know, from the byte and actually create the integer. So, yeah, I think it's... Uh, mm, I have...
haven't measured that per se, but I would disagree with you because when you when you ask object get integer field, it has on the assembler level still goes to some uh, some memory address, read four bytes and create an integer object from 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 that. Exactly the case that you go to, to some index which translates to, to, to some memory address and you read four bytes and create an, in, an integer. On the, on the assembler level is more or less the same. More questions? Okay, then you can grab me after, after that, but thank you for your attention.